All right, so I guess we're going to get started. All right, so my name is Garrett. I'm going to show you how to make a video game. Uh, we're going to use the Unity Game Engine, which is a program to make video games that makes it much easier than straight programming. I'm just going to quickly show you what we're going to try to make. Uh, hopefully, we have enough time. It's just going to be sort of a basic rocket game. From here, you're going to be like a rocket ship. You spawn a bunch of planets, and you're going to go around, and you're going to try to collect <laughs> So it's pretty basic, but it shouldn't take that long to do. All right, so if you have Unity installed, we're going to go to a launch Unity Hub. And under products, we're going to make a new project. And it should only let you select one version, whatever version you have. It doesn't really matter what version you have. It should work regardless. But try to pick the latest one. From here, you can just call it whatever you want and save it wherever you want. And select from the template, select 3D. Uh, that just sets it up easier for this kind of project. And then you'll hit 3D. And at, at any time, if you like have any troubleshooting or if you want to ask a question, please raise your hand. I'll try to stop throughout, help you guys out. Um, also, just reference the document that should help you a little bit. There is code at the bottom. If you just want to copy paste in code, that's perfectly fine. Um, if you get lost, you can just reference that. All right, so this is what should appear. It's an empty project. I'm just going to go over a basic overview of what you're looking at. So on the left-hand side, it's called the hierarchy. Basically, this is just a running list of all the objects that are in your scheme. So if, say, it's like an FPS game, it would be like your character, uh, the NPCs, the environment different light sources. The project view is what assets are in your project. So like your music, like your sprites or 2D art, your models, um, your scripts, etc. That's more on the back end. The scene view is basically a view of the game world. That's where we're going to look, be looking at a lot of time because that's where we're going to place our objects and sort of move stuff around. And then whenever we actually start the game, we would go to the game view, which is actually a display of what would come out as the final product. And then finally, there's the inspector. So if I were, for example, to click on the main camera, you can see in the inspector, it gives us several properties, like the transform, which is basically its that sort of properties in 3D space. And there's a couple other components that we're going to mess with later. So is everyone at this point that's have an empty product? We're ready to go. Yeah. All right. Cool. So the first step, what we're going to do is we're going to make our player, which is going to be the rocket. So what we're going to do is we're just going to organize it a little bit. We're going to make some empty game objects, which is really just for organizational purposes. What we're going to do is on the hierarchy view, we're going to right click. This lets you select different things to make. We're just going to go down to create empty, and it'll create an empty game object. And we're going to rename it. You can either go to the inspector and rename it here or you can right click, rename. We're just going to call it player. We're going to make another empty game object. And we're going to make sure it's a child of the player. So a child basically means it's connected to the player. And we're going to do that for the model of the player, or of the rocket. So here we're going to child it, and we're just going to call it model. And then we're just going to make sort of a makeshift looking rocket. Unity doesn't have any sort of pre-built 3D modeling capabilities, um, but they do have 3D models that we're going to make kind of look like a rocket. So now we're going to go right click 3D object, and we're going to start with a capsule. So here also, if you double click on the hierarchy, it will zoom in on whatever currently you have selected. So this is going to be the main part of our rocket. We're also going to add a cube, and then using this gizmo, here, you can click and drag to move that down. We're just going to make that sort of like the engine of the rocket. So we're just going to start with that. That's going to be our basic rocket. We're going to make it look a little bit prettier. We're going to add some materials to it. And materials are basically just sort of changing the way things look. So if you go to the product view, you right click, create, and then there's material right down here. Hit material, and we're just going to call it 
an arbitrary thing. I'm just going to call it route net. So the project view, this should be down at the bottom of the screen. Just right click, create, and material. And you can just call it whatever you can call it, rocket mat. That's why it's called mine. And if you click on it in the product view, you can see it gives you several properties in the inspector. What we're just going to do is we're going to go to the albedo, click on that white color. It'll pop up with this little menu. We're just going to change the color to sort of a gray, grayish color. Or you can change it to whatever you want. Exit out. And what we're going to do is you're going to click and drag from the product view. You're going to click and drag the material onto the capsule and then onto the cube. So that should change the color. So you can see if you click on them in the inspector, it has this new material. So you just click and drag onto there. All right. So has everyone got that? Excuse me, how do you get the sphere again? Like the sphere? So if you want to spawn objects on the hierarchy view, you would right click and go down to 3D objects and it lets you select. So I just did a capsule and a cube. You just make it whatever object you want. And it's like the no, material. I mean, is the material also how you add like textures and stuff? Yes, yes. So if you want to add textures, for example, this Alvito map, this is where you can kind of select how it looks. So I can make a checker pattern. So that's how you do it, yes. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to actually give some control to our player. We're going to make the rocket fly around. So there's a few things we want to do first. We're going to add what are called components. Unity is really nice that it has some pre-built things with it that will make things a lot easier, uh, especially with the physics system. Um, so we don't have to manually program all the physics, which would, which would really suck. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go to add component. From here, I want you to type rigid, and it should come up. With the rigid body, we're going to do the not 2D one, so just regular rigid body. I'm going to click that. That will add that component. So this is right on our main player game object here. So here, rigid body, we get several properties. What we want to do is we're going to uncheck here, use gravity. So that should not be checked. And under constraints, if we open that, and you'll see we have several options, we're going to freeze all the rotations, so the X, Y, and Z rotations all be frozen. All right, next we're going to add a box collider, and a collider is what you think it is. It will tell different objects what they are colliding with. We get this basic box collider. We're just going to make it a little bit bigger to fit the size of the rocket. If you just go on the X, Y, or Z, and you click and drag, it should let you change the size here. Or you can also mainly type in numbers here. Make it a little bit bigger than the rocket, just so it'll be easier in the future. So we should have the rigid body. So if you, you mean the boss ladder? Yeah. So if you go down the size here, and you hover over either the X, Y, or Z, it should give you this little icon. And if you click and hold, and drag your mouse left to right, unless you make it bigger or smaller. Cool. All right, now the next thing we do is we're going to add a script where we're actually going to tell the rocket what to do. So here we're going to go down to add component again, and we're going to go down to new script. We're going to click that. And we're going to make our own script. So we're going to make a script, and we're going to call it player control. So I'll name it here. I'm going to go to create and add. And now I'll add that script to your product and also to your player. So now to open the script, hopefully it, it works with the install. If you go to this little, the three buttons right here, you can just click and then edit script. And that should launch up Visual Studio. If it doesn't, let me know, or you might have to manually open it. And this is what we should be presented with. How do you get the 
is the uh, raw and map to the components. How do you get the scripts component? Yeah. If you go, so back here. So you can just add component, and then if you scroll down, there's a, the last one's a new script. You just click that, and then just name your script whatever you want. For the first one we're doing is player control, and then after you name it, create and add, and that lets you edit it. So do we all have the scripts open, play control script? All right. So we're going to start programming what our rocket does. We're just going to start with the basic movement through space and also the rotation. So start, we're going to, for show of hands, how many of you have no programming experience? OK, that's OK. We're not going to do some insane stuff, but I'll try to explain it as best I can. Um, it's going to be pretty basic. Um, but if you generally know some programming, it should be fine for you. All right, so we're going to declare a few variables. Um, we're just going to make it easier for us to change things later. So we're going to do at the top, so under class, right above these methods here, the start and update, we're going to declare a few variables. So we're going to do, we're going to type public, float, and we're going to call it rotate speed. And then we're going to make another float public float called thrust speed. So now we're going to go to our update method. So this is one of the default methods that Unity gives us. Update basically runs every frame. So you don't want to use this often because it is very intensive. You don't want to, for example, set text always an update because if it's not changing that often, it's just unnecessary um, memory use. But for this case, since we're moving a player, it makes sense to use update. So in update, what we're going to do is we're going to type out vector3. We're just going to call it rotation vector. So vector3, you guys probably all know what vectors are. A vector3 is a three-dimensional vector. And this is going to tell us the different direction in space to move our rocket. So we have vector3 rotation vector. We're going to say equals. We're going to make a new vector 3. And also, with Visual, type, video, <laughs> Visual Studio, if you're typing, if you start typing something, you see here, if you press Enter, it will fill out the rest of it. It just makes it a little bit easier and faster. So new vector 3, and you're going to do open close parentheses. And then inside, I'm going to type this all out first, and then I'll explain it. So here, we're doing input dot get access. Vertical, comma, and we're going to do zero, comma, and then we're going to do negative sign, input, dot get axis, horizontal. So what this means is the new vector 3 is assigning the vector in the x, y, and z coordinates. And the input.getAxis is Unity's system for taking an input from the player, which is really nice because this get axis vertical, they have some pre-built um, axis. So for example, if you want to move with W, S, A, and D, and also the arrow keys, this takes in both. So you can use whatever one you want, which is really helpful. So here you're setting the x axis to the ver or the x component of the vector to the vertical. The y vector, we're not going to use that because we're not going to, I guess, pitch or roll, or roll, roll the, um, the rocket. And then the last one is the horizontal axis. All right, so next, that just gives us a vector, but we actually need to move the rocket. So what we're going to do is we're going to type out transform dot rotate. And this is basically telling whatever object the script is assigned to to rotate by this vector. So inside rotate, you're going to type out rotation vector, and they'll do comma space dot self. So basically what is telling the, the object that's assigned to the script is that it's going to rotate based on this vector, and space dot self is basically saying it's a local rotation as opposed to the world space. So no matter where a rocket moves, it's going to rotate relative to the rocket, not to the world. All right, cool. 
All right, so the next thing we're going to do is now the rocket rotates, but it doesn't move anywhere. So we want to actually make it move instead of just rotating in a still space. So here, we're going to add a little conditional. So we're just going to make it so that the rocket will only move when you're pressing the space bar, um, just to make it a little bit more fun and have a little bit more control. So we're going to add a conditional. We're going to add an if statement. So we're going to type out if, you're going to do input dot get key. And inside parentheses, you're going to type out key code dot space. So this is going to run every time the space bar is held. So it'll keep running when the space bar is held. Then you're going to add your curly braces. And then inside the if statement, you're going to do transform dot translate, which is the same idea as rotate, except you're actually moving it, not just rotating it. And then inside translate, we're going to do a new vector 3. And then you're going to add the parentheses. And then inside this vector, the first one's going to be 0, comma, and then you're going to do thrust b, which is the variable we declared earlier, comma, 0. And then semicolon at the end. So with the rocket, we're only going to move one direction. The thrust goes down, so that's the only way we're going to move. The rotation vector will take care of the rest. All right, so now that's what we're going to do for now. If we go back to Unity, we can see that under player control in the, hot, or in the inspector view that we have these two variables displayed. And they default to zero, but we don't want it to be zero. So I just found some arbitrary numbers. We're just going to set the rotate speed to two and the thrust speed to 0.3. Right, now, if we hit play, you will be able to see your rocket. And if you hit the space bar, it goes all screen. So that works. It works. But that's not what we want, because now the camera is just in still space, and now we can't see where we're going. I guess we could, maybe we can see it. There you go. But that's not what we want. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the camera and parent it to the player object itself. So wherever the object goes, the player object goes, the camera will follow. So here, what we're going to do, just to make it a little bit easier, I should go to the Game tab. You should see it here. If you don't see the Game tab, I should go to Window, and then General, and it should say Game. So you open that up if you don't have it. And what's nice about Uni and this sort of program is that you can sort of move around these different elements. So I can make this bigger or smaller, and I can also dock and undock stuff. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drag this game view. I'm just going to drag it into this corner here. And it'll let me see both the scene view and the game view. So now what we're going to do from here, we're going to take our camera and we're going to parent it under the player. So it's right under the player here. And we're just trying to position it a little bit. It doesn't matter exactly. You can kind of just leave it here. But I'm just going to change it a little bit. The same idea with the boss glider. If I click here and drag in the rotation, I can rotate it up. And again, if I go to the scene view, this gizmo here, which if you don't have this one, if you click this top icon here, that lets you move it. I'm just going to drag it down. So you can kind of see the rocket a little bit better. I'm going to have to kind of tail it from behind. So you can position it wherever. And now if we hit play, then whenever we actually move a rocket, it follows with us. All right. So is everyone good up until this point? We good? How did you do that again? For the camera? Yeah. So I took the camera, it should have been just up here. I dragged it underneath the player, so it's a child of it now. And then just to move it around, you can either just manually move these values by clicking and dragging where the position and rotation is, or you can also go to the scene view here and just drag around this gizmo and then just move the position like that. It doesn't you can just leave the camera off where it is, but the sort of back view just looks cool to me. But you can kind of position it wherever. As long as it's parented to it, then that's what we want. We want to be able to see the rocket and also just see the world around it. Alright. So
So the next step is that the world's pretty boring right now. So what we're going to do is we're going to add planets. And we're not just going to place planets. What we could do is just spawn a bunch of, or make a bunch of objects. Here you're going right click, 3D object, and then say sphere. And we have our so-called planet. And we can just kind of duplicate this and move them around. But that would take a while. And for some games, that might be a cool thing. Um, we're going to do something a little bit differently. We're going to randomly generate a bunch of planets in the world. Um, we're going to make them different colors, different scales, and just to make it so each time every player runs the game, it will be different for each player. So here we're going to start by actually making what our planet, we're going to call it a prefab, which is sort of like a template. We want to have one planet that is similar, or rather, that we're going to base off of all the other planets, so that whenever we spawn them, if you want to change one, it will change all of them, which is way better than manually changing each one. So here, if you didn't do that yet, you just go right click, 3D object sphere, and I'm just going to rename this to planet. What I'm also going to do is I'm going to make another material. So I'm going to go right click on the product view, create, and then go down to material. I'm just going to call this planet map. You just make it whatever color you want, that it'll change later. And then again, you would select, click and hold your planet mat, and then drag onto the planet object, and it will change its color. So now what we're going to do is we're going to set up the script that actually spawns all the planets. And we're not going to put it on the planet itself, because although it would work if we have this one planet, and then that planet spawns another, and so on and so on, it's not that efficient. So what we're going to do is we're going to make what's called a game manager, which is a central object that handles a bunch of different stuff like that. It's not on individual um, objects. So here what we're going to do is we're going to go to the hierarchy, and you're going to right click, and we're going to make another empty game object. And we're just going to call it Game Manager. And I just like to drag it up to the top. It doesn't matter. And then on this Game Manager object, we're going to make another script. So we're going to go to Add Component. Scroll down to New Script. And we're going to call this one Spawn Planets. We go here. Edit script, and we should be good. All right, so in this script, we're basically going to tell the game that whenever it starts, we want to randomly generate a bunch of planets. So what we're going to do is we need a to reference our planet that we made from before. So we're going to go here, and we're going to type public, and we're going to make a game object variable, which is built in with Unity. We're going to make a public game object, and we're going to call it planet, Prefab. Is there um, any reason why it's public instead of private or protected? Yes, so you you can do it different ways in Unity, but for example, if you make a public variable in Unity, whenever we go to the inspector, it shows up here. If it was private, then it wouldn't show up. So what we're going to do later is we're going to assign whatever this planet prefab is. Um, we're going to click and drag it, so it just makes it visible. It's a lot easier to, to manage stuff than if you actually um, what to assign stuff. That's a good question. Cool. All right. So now we're going to make another variable. We're going to call it public int. We're going to call it number of planets to spawn. A little long, but we know what's doing. All right. So now in the start method, we're going to make a for loop, which you don't know, it's basically just a way of iterating through a list of numbers. We're just going to iterate through the number of planets so that each time it iterates, it's going to spawn a new planet. So here for for loop, you're going to type for and in parentheses. We're going to do a basic for loop. Type int i is equal to zero, semicolon. We're going to do i is less than number of planets to spawn, semicolon. And then i plus plus, which means we'll just increase i once it's over. We're going to add our curly braces. And then inside here, we're going to add a bunch of things to spawn our planet. 
the first thing we do is we're going to set the position of our planet. We don't want the planet to be in a specific position because if we add the same position each time, it's just going to spawn on top of each other. So we're going to generate a random position. So first we're going to do that vector 3 again. Vector 3, and we're just going to call it pause, short for position, equals new vector 3. And what we're going to do here is we're going to generate a random number in space. So we're going to type out inside here, we're going to do random dot range, and in parentheses, we type negative 1000 f comma 1000 f. So what this is doing, it is generating a random number from negative 1000 to 1000. And that's going to be used to place our planet in space. So each time it iterates through this loop, it will generate a new random number. So hopefully no two planets will spawn on top of each other. It could happen, but more likely not. So because of the vector 3, we need to assign 3 of these. So you're going to do comma. And right here, you can just copy this. And I'm just going to paste it two more times. So in the x, y, and z position, is going from negative 1,000 to 1,000. The next thing we want to do is actually we want to spawn our planet. And Unity has this built-in function called instantiate, which actually makes the object. So what we're going to do is we're going to reference it as well. So we're going to type in game object, and we're just going to call it planet. This is just a local game object for what we're going to reference later in this for loop. And we're going to say equals, and we're going to type instantiate. So this is actually a spawner object, but we need to set a few parameters first. So in parentheses, it's like the first parameter is the actual object itself, so which is going to be our planet prefab. Here you do comma, and you type in pause, which is your position vector where it will spawn in space, and common, co comma, and the final one is rotation. It doesn't really matter for these planets, but it's going to type is called quaternion dot identity, which is basically shorthand for the zero, zero, zero rotation. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to change up our planet's scale just to make sure they're not all the same size. So on a similar thing, we're going to type in here, we're going to make another local variable called float. We're going to call it scale amount. And again, we're going to set this equal to a random number. So here we're going to do equals, we're going to type random dot range, and here we're going to do a little smaller number, we're going to do 0.1f to 75f. So it will set the scale dependent from 0.1 all the way up to 75. And now we actually want to set the planet to that. So what we're going to do is we're going to reference that planet object that we just spawned. So here we're going to do planet dot scale amount, I'm sorry, scale, planet dot transform dot local scale. And we're going to set that equal to a new vector 3. And on the three vectors, you just type scale amount for all three. So that just make sure that the planet's not wonky looking, it's still going to be a sphere, but it's going to be a big or small sphere. And the final thing we're going to do with the planets is make them different colors, which I think looks kind of cool. Unity has this built-in system for generating colors. Colors are usually just combinations of different numbers, values. They use RGBA, there's CMYK. Um, we're just going to do a basic one. We're not going to mess with the alpha value. So here, we're going to make a local color. So you're going to type in color, and we're just going to call it random color. You set that equal to a new color. And in parentheses, we're going to generate a random number again. The color values go from 0 to 1, so that's what we're going to generate. So here, you're going to type random dot range, and you're going to do 0 f to 1 f. And just just to clarify, we're typing f after numbers, does that make sure it's a float? If I just did 0 to 1, it would literally just generate a number of either 0 or 1. And we don't want that. We want a range between 0 all the way to 1. We want like 0 0.5, 0 0.25, so that, which is what the f does. And we're just going to make sure to do that for all three. We don't need to enter the value for uh, the alpha, it will just default to 1 if we don't put it. This is a little bit 
So, the, we don't. Oh. <laughs> they, they can. So it's, it's generating a random number each time for where it's in position. It's generating from negative 1,000 to 1,000. Oh, like, so if you wanted to connect that, you would store the numbers in the database? Yes, yeah, okay. you could. But we're, we're not doing that. There is a chance that they could fall on top of each other, but, but yeah. Okay. All right, so now with our color, we're going to actually assign it. So what we're going to do is we're going to reference our planet from earlier. We're going to do planet. The next thing we're going to do is get component. So it's basically going to tell our planet object, okay, we have our planet, but we want to get a certain component from the planet. So we're going to type dot get component. I'm going to do these angle brackets. And inside that, I'm going to type mesh render, which that is what's actually generating our mesh, whatever the sphere is looking like that is what it's being generated as. So here, after that, we're going to do open close parentheses. From here, we're going to do dot material, which is going to get the first material of the planet, and then dot color. Now we're going to set that equal to our random color. So now that we have that, we should be able to go back to Uni. And what the first thing we need to do is assign our planet prefab. So prefabs, what we're going to do is we're going to store that in the product itself. So all we're going to do is we're going to take our planet object we made here, and you're going to click and drag it into the product view. That will create it as a prefab. So what it allows you to do is open prefab, and you can edit it here, and that will make the changes to all the objects in the scene. So you don't have to mainly set it for each one. It will just change it for the one, and it will change it for all of them. What is a prefab? It's like it's like a template. So so basically think like just think like a template where we have this planet prefab where all the other planets that are generated will be based off this prefab. So it will if we generate a planet prefab, it will generate this planet with the same components, the same you know, scripts or whatever we have for this prefab. Um, so without the prefab, then what do you do? Yeah, so we're basically telling it that the object we want to generate is this prefab. You can't, I mean, I think you can actually do it live in the scene. You can assign it in runtime. But it's basically just storing this object in the file, and then we're telling the script that the object we want to generate is this object from the file. All right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to take that planet prefab here, and you click and drag it onto your spawn planet script. That should be here. And now what we're going to do is the number of planets to spawn. You can pick whatever number you want. Um, a thousand is usually too big, so I'm just going to type 300. You can spawn however you want. It will just generate that many numbers, whatever you set there. And finally, just to make it a little bit more space feeling, just go to your main camera, click on that, and where it says clear flags, you want to go to this drop down, it's going to select solid color. And that lets you change this background color, and we're just going to change it to black. And there is more cool stuff you can do with this. You can make skyboxes, um, like custom space things, but for now, we're just going to make it black. All right, so now hopefully, we have all this done and we hit play. You should see that a bunch of different color and size planets have spawned. Now we can move around and see all. Of them. All right. So has anyone had any trouble with that? Are we good? Good. You good? Like you, like stars in the background. You mean? Yeah. Yeah. So you can generate it the same way. You can make stars like this. Um, you can do the same thing with the prefab. But if you want to make it like, I, I would do it with the, like the skybox, and I would just put stars in that. Um, that would just be like you mainly painting that skybox. Um, but yeah. So same idea. If you want to spawn anything, you could just do it exactly the same with the, the planet prefab.
All right, so now the next thing we're going to do is that the scheme right now is it's kind of cool looking, but there's really not much to do except to fly around and explore. So what we're going to do is we're going to add something to do. We're going to add these coin collectibles that you can go and pick up. So here, we're going to make another prefab. We're going to call it coin. So here, you're going to right click, 3D object, and we're just going to make a cylinder. And what we're going to do, you can drag it wherever, it doesn't matter. We're just going to scale it down. So you can either manually scale by clicking and dragging here, or if you go to, if you hit R or go to this gizmo, it lets you scale it different directions. So we're just going to make it look a little bit more like a coin. We're also going to rename it to coin. And we're also going to give it a material. Again, go to project, right click, create, and material. We're just going to call it coin mat. And I will just make it yellow. And the same thing again, you're going to click and drag onto your coin. Now what we're also going to do is just make the coin a little bit cooler is there's different effects that Unity has. So one of the default effects is a trail. So if you go onto the coin, you right click, effects, and there's trail. Now it should make a trail a child of that coin. So you can see what the trail does. If I, for example, to move this coin, you see that there's a trail behind it. What we're going to do is we're just going to add a little bit of flair to it. We're just going to change the color. If you click here, and we're going to click this bottom one on the left. Here, I'm just going to change the color to sort of that yellow color. And then this other side, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the top right one, and that lets me change the alpha value or the opacity. So I'm just going to bring that all the way down. So it sort of fades out the trail as it's going. So now you can see if I were to move it, it's yellow and it fades out. All right, so like the planet, we're going to make this a prefab again. So you're going to click that coin, and you're going to drag it onto your project. And now we have our coin prefab. Now here we're going to go back to our coin object in a hierarchy, and we're going to add a script to it. It's going to be a very basic script. Look here, go to new script, and then we're going to type, we're just going to call it coin, and then create an app. Alright, so now we're going to go here, edit, script. We are going to change one thing about our coin. We're going to make our coin move uh, so it's not just sitting in still space. So here we're just going to make one variable. We're going to call it a public float. We're going to call it coin move speed. And now we're going to go to our update method. And like we did before with the rocket, we're going to go transform.translate. We're going to make a new vector 3, and we're just going to do 0, comma, coin move speed, comma, 0. And after the vector 3, we're going to do a comma, space, dot self. And like the rocket, this is basically just telling it it's just going to move forward relative to itself. We're going to generate a different rotation leader. So now if we go back to Unity here, we can select our coin move speed, and we're just going to set it to something like 0.1. Now another great thing about prefabs is change some stuff to it. But now instead of actually having to go into and copy the stuff into the prefab, what you can do is with the objects in the scene, where it says overrides here, if you click on that, it tells you the things that you just changed about your prefab from the original. What we're going to do is just going to click Apply All. So that makes sure that every coin that is now generated will be exactly like this one. So now if you hit Play, no 
might shoot off screen, but you can see that the coin is now moving forward. So again, with our plants, we just don't want to spawn just every single coin before. We just want to randomly generate it. It's a little bit easier. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go back to your game manager, and we're going to make another script, and you're going to call it spawn coins. Our new script. It's kind of too bad. Also, just for the sake of time, if you guys want to go to the Planet Serum show that starts in like nine minutes, but you won't offend me if you want to go to that. Um, but if you want to stick around, I'll try to try to finish this as well. All right. So now in our spawn coin script, we're going to do a similar thing to the planets where we're going to reference our coin prefab, and then we're going to like iterate through a for loop. I just had the coin. Did you, did you make the pre map already? Did you drag it into the like the product view here? script in the game manager here. So we'll just edit that. And again, like the planets, what we're going to do is type out public game object. We're going to do coin prefab. Now we're going to make another public int number of coins to spawn. And again, in the start, we're going to make another loop to go through all of the coins that we want to spawn and actually spawn them. So here we're going to do for then int i is equal to zero, semicolon, number of coins, to, or rather, i is less than number of coins to spawn, semicolon, i plus plus. So again, we're going to set it a random position in space. We go to vector three. Call pause. Is equal to new vector three. 
And then we're going to do random.range. And we're just going to do negative 100f to 100f. And just going to do that for all three values of the vector 3. And after that, what we're going to make is called a quaternion, which is kind of like the brother of the vector 3. I don't know exactly how to explain it, but it just makes it easier um, for some of these values. It just makes it easier from, I guess, a developer perspective, because the other way of doing it, the values are kind of weird. So we're going to type out quaternion. We're just going to call it rot, short for rotation, is equal to quaternion dot Euler or Euler, however you pronounce it. And again, we're going to do a similar thing. We're just going to generate a random number from 0 to 360. We're going to do random dot range, 0f, comma, 360f. And we're going to do that. Yeah, so this is setting the angle of the coin. So that whenever we spawn it, not all like flying the same direction, they're kind of going. And then the last thing we'll do is we're actually going to spawn our coin. So again, we don't really need to make a reference to it. So just go instantiate. And from here, I'm going to type the first one is the coin prefab itself, comma, that position vector, comma, and that rotation quaternion. So the first one is the first one is the object itself, whatever it's spawning. The next one is its position, where you want it in the world, and the next one is the rotation. So what's nice about instantiate is that what's called they're called overloading operators. So whenever you instantiate, you don't necessarily have to assign all of them. So there's different ways you can do it, where you can just do like the coin prefab, and it will default the position and rotation. There is, if you go here, um, where you see it says like plus nine overloads, there's different values that you can type. Um, I think you can also do, you can do transform.parent, so I can also add you know, what object I want this object to be parented to. Um, it just lets you be a little bit more flexible with that. Um, but right now, all we're doing is the object itself, where its position and where its rotation is. All right, so now if you go back, Unity. We have our spawn coins here. What we're going to do is we're going to go to our coin prefab, click and drag onto here. And then our number of coins to spawn, we're just going to start with 100. And then now, if we hit play, we should see our planets and also a bunch of flying coins. Now, unfortunately, we can't do anything with that right now. For the scene, you mean? Yeah. Yes, yes. So by default, we just have this direction light here. That's what's lighting our scene right now. Mm -hmm. um, if you double click it here, you do get options for it. Um, so I can change the color of it. You can see it on the game view, it changes a little bit. Um, you can also, as well, right click light, and you can select different light options. There is plenty of lighting options. Um, I'm going very basic, but if you really get into Unity, there's some really cool lighting stuff, like very like, photorealistic. Um, but it does take take a lot of work and a lot of skill that not there yet. Um, <laughs> but uh, but it does let you do a heck of a lot of lighting. So we are at the end. Um, I am more than happy. I still have a little bit left. You guys want to stick around? Um, we're just going to kind of make it so you can actually do stuff, interact with stuff. Um, 
But if you're done, then feel free to go. Um, but we're just going to add it so that you can actually collect the coins and also um, dis destroy the planets as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to make it that each time we hit a coin is that we're going to destroy it, um, like we pick it up. So here what we're going to do is we're going to go back to our player, and you're going to edit that script. What we're going to do is we're going to add a new method, which is called onCollisionEnter. If you hit enter, it should automatically generate this. This is again one of Unity's pre-built methods, uh, which is basically telling it the frame that two objects collide, this will run. And this collision here, that parameter, that is automatically given by Unity, this is basically telling the object that was just hit. So since this script is on the player itself, this collision parameter, that will be whatever object is hitting the player. So inside here, we don't want to just run it with any object it's hitting, we want to make sure it's the coin for this case. So we're going to do another conditional, we're going to type if, we're going to do collision dot game object dot compare tag coin. Which basically is just saying if whatever object is being collided with, if that has a tag of coin, this will run. We'll assign the coin tag in a little bit. So here, all we're going to do is we're going to go to, we're going to type out destroy. It's one of the pre-built functions. And inside, we're going to do collision dot game object. So now, if you go back to Unity, what we actually need to do is we need to assign the tag to our coin. It has a name coin, but it doesn't have the tag coin, which is a little bit easier for control and stuff. So what we're going to do, we're going to go to tag, we click down here, there's a the homework. And we're going to go down to add tag. Here it gives us a list, right now it's an empty list. You need to generate some default tags, but we're going to add some of our own. We click here, that plus, we're just going to call it coin. Hit save. Now, if you go back to our coin, we go to the drop down again, and now you see we have coin. We're going to select that. And again, we want to set that prefab, so we go back to overrides, apply all. So now all the coins will have the coin tag. So now, hopefully, if we hit play, and then we run into one of the coins, it destroys it. Alright, All right, so the last thing we're going to do is we actually want to have some visual representation because we can destroy the coins we see that we did, but we're really not getting much feedback from that. So we're going to add a little bit of a score, which is going to keep track of how many coins we collected. So again, we're going to go to our game manager. We're going to add component. We're just going to call it, we're just going to call it game underscore manager. to edit that script. Now I didn't really explain this before, but up top, these are default Unity libraries. That's just basically telling the code that it's referencing this other code that we're going to pull from. That's how we're getting that quaternion and, and the on collision. Um, we're, we're programming in C sharp, I probably should have said that earlier, but um, that's the language of programming in and that has default uh, libraries. But these are ones from Uni, or rather this one is from one from Uni, um, which is, we're getting those different values from. We're gonna add another one, which is called Text Mesh Pro. So we're gonna type using, and just call it here, TM Pro. 
which Text Mesh Pro is Unity's, uh, one of the Unity systems for text. Um, they actually have a default text system, but the Text Mesh Pro is kind of default and it's way better. I don't know why it's not default, um, but we're gonna use that because we want to actually display our score on text. So now here we're gonna make a variable, we're gonna call it public, and this is a long name, it's called text mesh pro U GUI. That's just our text object. And it's gonna call it score text. Now next, we're just gonna make an int, which is actually going to be our score. So public int score. Now in start, as soon as it runs, we just want to set our score text to a default value, which if the score starts at zero, we're just gonna set it to that. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna get our score text object dot text, which is the actual text of it, is equal to score dot two string, and then in parentheses. That score dot two string is taking that score in value and it's converting it to a string value. Which it should be the same regardless. Now what we're going to do is we're going to make another method. Um, like I said before, what we could do is we could go here and just do the same thing in update. But that's not very efficient. Is that the score will change over time, but it's not going to change every frame. And just to have that running every frame, it's really memory intensive and you don't need that. So what we're going to do is we're going to make a function that only runs whenever the score changes. So instead of putting an update, we're going to make a new method. We're just going to call it public, and we're going to call it, or sorry, public void, which is returning nothing. We're going to call it change score, and then open close parentheses, and open close curly braces. From here, we're going to increase our score by one, so you're going to type score. This is just a shorthand version. You're going to type plus equals one, which basically adds one to the current score value. And then again, this is when we're ever going to reset the text. We just copy and paste from above. Score text dot text is equal to score dot two string. So this is just making sure whenever the game starts that it defaults. So I, I will more explain it in a second. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to make our text. Um, so we're going to do here is you're going to right click UI and then text dash text mesh pro. Now you should get a prompt that makes you import the text mesh pro stuff. You just want to click the top one, import TMP essentials, that will download. And you can X out of that. Now we can actually use Text Mesh Pro. So we should have our canvas here and underneath our text object. And we're just going to rename this to score text. Just to make it a little bit easier to navigate. You can click up here in the scene view, it says 2D. This will format the camera to be in 2D view, which is good for UI elements. And you're just going to drag this, or again, you can mainly move it here. We're just going to drag it up to the top. Here, just make it a little bit cooler. I'm just going to change the color. There's several other properties you can change of. Um, there's plenty of options here. Um, you make the text look a lot cooler, but we're going to do it pretty basic. I'm also just going to center it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to my game manager, and now I have my score text. I'm going to click and drag the score text. Okay. Now, so to answer your question, what we're doing at the start, we're setting the score text to the score. Is that, for example, if you just left it like this, if we were to start the game without that first thing, it would just stay as it was just stay as new text. Yeah. So we're just making sure with this is that whenever it starts, it's setting this value to the default score, which is being zero. Yeah, so I, I could also just go here, type zero, and it would just stay as zero. I wouldn't need that. Um, but I just like to do that just to make sure if I end up changing this um, if it defaults to the correct value. Um, 
it also might change depending on what I want to do. Like maybe I want to do here, I could also do, for example, score, and then plus here if I wanted to change that. Um, I find it a little bit easier to change it in script because say if I wanted to change it here first, then I need to go back and change it in script anyway. If I change the script first and just update here, this makes it a little bit easier. Um, but yes, you could go, go either way about it. All right. So now this script works, but we have nothing actually calling it. It's, we have this method, but nothing's actually going to call it. So what we want to do is that we have made earlier where we had our player control and we collide with it. This is what we're going to call it because that's when it's destroying the object. So we know that once it's destroyed, that a coin has been collected. So that's why we're going to change our score. But first, what we need to do is we need to reference our game manager script. Because it's on a different object, we don't have a direct reference to it. So what we're going to do is we're going to make another variable under play control. We call it a public. We're going to call it the script name. So game underscore manager. And we're going to call it, we call it game manager. So actually what we're going to do is we'll kind of almost to go by the question. We're, for example, going to make this one private. So what we're going to do is that if we go back to Unity and we go to yeah, go to our player, you can see it's not there, but well, there's still that variable to it. So what we can do is in start, we can assign that game manager. So what we're going to do is we're going to type out game manager is equal to, and we're going to do game object dot find object of type, and we got open and close brackets, or rather things, and then we're going to type game manager, and then open close parentheses, and semicolon. So basically, this is saying, okay, the game ma game manager is equal to an object that it finds with the type with the script of the game manager, um, which for this case it will only be this one. Um, so as soon as it starts, it will assign this. Now this works and that's fine. And um, depending on your game, if you have the central game manager, this is perfectly fine to do. Um, however, this is one of the more intense operations where this is not something you want to do in update because that would just be very intensive. If it's going through and finding this object multiple times, um, it just adds a lot to the memory. Um, but you can perfectly do it here. And this just guarantees that it's assigned to this game manager. If you only have one, that's definitely going to be this one. Um, so there's different ways of, of referencing stuff. There's not necessarily one best way, um, but there is bad ways. Uh, but this is not, how we're doing it is not a bad way. And so the last thing we want to do is we're going to call that function from the game manager. Now that we have a reference to it, we can call that function since we made it a public function. So here we're going to type out game manager. And this should be the variable name, not the script name of the game manager. Dot chain score, open close parentheses, and then semicolon. Now if you save. We'll go back here, if we hit play, see so how I set my score, it just says score and go through zero. And now if I go and collect a coin, there's now one, which I didn't change it. I didn't change it here, but now it will properly update. So we get another two. And we collect as many coins as we want.